Peace and much love, Zinaru here. Welcome to the latest installment of Message from the Minister. I am Zinaru, and this week's message from the minister is a whole new creation. A whole new creation. Yo, I can't wait to get started. This week we're going to be reading from the Bhagavad Gita for the first time. I've been waiting for a while because I've been wanting to share the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. But there's just so much to know about the Bhagavad Gita to just go into it and start reading from it without any kind of point of reference. It, it doesn't make the same amount of sense as it actually can when there's a reference point. So this week I'm going to give some reference points right before we talk and we get into the Bhagavad Gita. Also have a reading this week from our teacher from KRS-One and the Gospel of Hip Hop from Perform Action. And we're also going to be talking about in consciousness. And all of this gets together and all of this interweaves with one another because what we're talking about this week is a whole new creation. I want to welcome you all here. I want to thank you all for being here. As I say every week, and as I remind my nobility every week, that in the spirit, there is no such thing as time or space, that we are all together in the great wholeness, in the great oneness, right here, right now. So no matter how far into the future somebody is watching this video, or how far away somebody may be from the space that this video is being filmed in, we are all here together right here, right now, in this time and space. And I want to welcome you all here. I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to get started. So <laughs> let's get started this week. Um, it's been a few weeks since we took three deep breaths. So uh, let's start out with that. I always want to remind my nobility, the power of breath. When we can take three deep breaths, I call these cleansing breaths. These are traditionally called cleansing breaths. Um, we're going to take these three deep breaths. We're going to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. And while we're breathing and while we're exhaling, we're going to notice that our blood begins to flow more. Our heart becomes warmer. It even beats a little bit deeper. Our brain and thinking becomes more clear. And we have access to more ideas and more information because we have more oxygen in our blood, because it's moving more freely, and because our mind is more clear. Always remember this, that in any situation that you feel out of sorts, that you feel out of your way, that you're just not feeling right in a situation, maybe something crazy happens in your environment or um, you're feeling anxious about something, to take these three deep breaths, to just go take a minute by yourself, go into this, the bathroom if you're at a party, uh, go, go around the corner if you're at a relative's house, uh, if you're at a, wherever you're out and about in the city, whatever it is that you're doing if you're at work, this only takes a few seconds to actually do, but it can improve your day from that point on. And so I just want to invite y'all to join me uh, with this breathing exercise. And once again, we're going to take three deep breaths in through the nose, and we're going to be breathing into what's called the Don Diem. Uh, in Tai Chi, we call this the Don Diem. Uh, the palace of incorruptible breath. This is where the breath, there's this palace of incorruptible breath, a breath that has been, hasn't been tainted by the world, an oxygen source that hasn't been tainted by any of the poisons in our body or in our environment. It comes from the fifth dimension itself. It comes from the kingdom of heaven within. And so I'm going to show you how to find this breath right now as you take your uh, left hand and you place your thumb over your belly button over what's called the navel and uh, and then you cup the bottom of your hand just kind of around your lower belly there your lower abdomen and then you take your right hand and you place it there as well and then you breathe into that space that's directly two inches behind where your hands are so it's about two inches below your belly button and two inches back into your stomach that is called the don diem the palace of incorruptible breath and so just take a, just take a second and just kind of fill, fill your, your tummy up. Just take a breath in. This won't be one of the exercises, but just fill your, expand your belly when you breathe in. See how that, I don't know if you can see that on camera, but I expanded my belly when I breathed in. I'm holding this breath in. Then when I breathe out, I'm, I'm, I'm contracting my stomach 
and I'm pushing the air out through my stomach, out through my mouth. So that's a little bit deeper of the uh, breath than that we've even talked about in the past. But really the concentration is to fill your whole stomach up, fill your lungs up. There's even little air packets, um, resonance chambers up here underneath the armpits. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's these other resonance chambers that you can fill your breath up in your stomach, in your lungs, and then fill these little things up right here. You can feel that right there. So that's a full breath. You just get that breath in full and then you release it. So let's begin. I like to do this standing up too. I kind of do this thing. I go like that. So let's begin. You kind of you kind of put your wings out. Breathe in through the nose. One. Hold it for a second. Breathe out through the mouth. Remember to breathe it all in and let it all out. Hold it for a second. Breathe in number two. Hold it for a second. Push it down. <sighs> Breath three, breathe in through the nose. Hold it for a second. And when you let it out, you can push it down and give it a big stretch. Release. <sighs> yeah, now feel that body. Feel how your body just feels more relaxed. Feel how it feels more fluid, how you're more focused, how you're more in tune with the body and with, with your environment itself. This is such a deep breathing exercise and it's so great to do. And, and in Tai Chi, you, you know, and these other, and even yoga, you breathe in and you just pull the breath up through the earth, even through the bottom of our feet. And we pull the breath in also from the top of our crown. So we're just pulling this breath in from our environment, from all around. And we're releasing it. We're releasing it all out too. And what happens is we start feeling the energy, our energetic connection between us and our environment. And we're going to get into that night tonight because, as I said before, the message is um, <laughs> a whole new creation, a whole new creation. We talked a few weeks ago about wholeness and holy are you, the message from the minister, holy are you. You might want to revisit that or if you've seen that one already, this is what we're talking about, a whole new creation feeling our whole selves, being our whole selves at any moment. You know, as Edgar Cayce says, we, um, heaven is not a place you grow, go to. Heaven is a place you grow to. So heaven, we're, not, we're growing into who we are gradually. This whole idea that enlightenment just comes and every one minute you don't know nothing and the next minute you know everything. No, enlightenment is a gradual process. It's growth. It's growing. And when we grow into something new, we become a whole new creation. We could use the butterfly as a great example of what a whole new creation looks like. When the caterpillar is, is crawling along, it doesn't resemble a butterfly. It doesn't live the life of a butterfly. What happens is the caterpillar crawls along, and then when time calls, it spins itself into a cocoon. It creates this cocoon for itself, and inside this cocoon, it's turned into this gelatinous glob. It doesn't even have a brain anymore, and then after time, it forms into the butterfly within the cocoon, and then spreads forth its wings, breaks through the cocoon, and is now a butterfly. Same being but totally different being. It's a whole new creation. The, the caterpillar no longer exists. What exists now is the butterfly. But it grows. It's a gradual process that it goes into. It's a, you, know, you can see it in a time ellipse the life of a, of a caterpillar into a butterfly. It's a gradual process of the, of the, of the caterpillar growing into the butterfly. Same thing with a seed growing into a tree. There's a gradual process 
that the seed is under the earth, it's in the darkness, it's feeling in itself in the darkness, which is what a, you know, one of the greatest metaphors for life. And we find ourselves in this darkness, in these dark times that we may not have planned for ourselves. The world is finding itself in that right now. You know, we're going through a collective, what's called the dark night of the soul collectively, as the earth is actually purging out of itself a fallen form of consciousness, a, a form of consciousness that no longer is helping humanity, a form of consciousness and a group of people who are deliberately enslaving humanity. And so a whole new creation, we want to be mindful that the world is going through a dark night of the soul. Those of us who are spiritual right now, we're feeling that. We're learning to go more within with what's going on in the world. We're cocooning ourselves in so that when we emerge collectively, now I'm speaking collectively, especially hip hop, hip hop, we are going to collectively emerge and be born into the butterfly that we were born to be, grow into the tree from the seed that we were born to be. But remember, Remember, that seed had to go into darkness. That seed had to be buried into darkness before it could sprout forth and grow into the tree that it was destined to be. All the time, the seed held all the codes, the higher intelligence, the governing intelligence of God, of the universe, knows what that seed has inside of it, this potential. And as it breaks free it, through the ground, it grows into the tree. And it also grows down deeper, too, into the roots of the darkness. It, it starts feeling the darkness and knowing the darkness is another form of light as it grows into the tree. And it's nourished by the darkness, by the nutrition in the soil. It's also nourished by the light, by the sunlight and the stars and the moon as well and all kinds of other things that are going on birds standing on a branch nourish the tree because it can make the branch stronger same thing with the wind the wind blows the wind blows the young tree but what that does is it creates a stem that gets stronger and not only can it flex in the wind not only can the branches flex in the wind it's becoming stronger so it's adapting to its environment these are very very important lessons from nature because if you're going through something right now, if the winds of life are blowing on you right now, if you find yourself even in this as a seed state in the darkness, you're feeling yourself in the darkness of times. Remember that God, that the, the highest intelligence of the universe, the creator of all that is has encoded in you this ability to become a whole new you, to go from the seed into the tree, from the caterpillar into the butterfly. And God doesn't just do this with individuals. God also does this with entire cultures. And that's what we are experiencing right now in hip hop. We are actually cocooned inside this place of darkness. Even inside the cocoon is dark. And we're going through this metamorphosis right now. And what we're doing is we're being protected and shut off from the outside world right now. Now in nature, they're protected from being shut off from predators, from animals, and from other things that may want to, a bird may want to eat that seed if it's not buried in the dark deep enough. Um, a, a, a bird may want to come and eat that caterpillar if it's not cocooned and well hidden and camouflaged inside of its darkness. So always keep that in mind. And for a deeper overstanding, you can go into the gospel of hip hop and study the eighth overstanding in darkenment. But that's not going to be the discussion here today. There's so much we could discuss with the gospel of hip hop. And I'm just going to bring certain concepts in for those of you who are new with the gospel of hip hop or those of you who have been studying the gospel of hip hop for a while. I want to just bring in certain concepts from the gospel of hip hop that will help guide the hip hop who's actually taken the gospel of hip hop seriously to have a deeper understanding or actually a deeper overstanding even of what the gospel of hip hop is actually saying. And the reason I'm able to do this is because I've been living its wisdom for the past 15, 16 years now. And, um, you know, I'm a product of that philosophy of the wisdom of the gospel of hip hop. And I'm also wanting to even go back even further back into the Bhagavad Gita today and um, talk about uh, Krishna's lesson to Arjuna about um, 
the, uh, the yoga of action. We're going to be talking about perform action from the gospel of hip hop. And we're going to go back to some ancient manuscript time uh, with the Bhagavad Gita, the song of life. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, how Krishna teaches to Arjuna the yoga of action. Because we're talking about a whole new creation right here and right now. And both of these readings today are going to get into what it means to be a whole new creation, what kind of actions to perform, what kind of sight we should have as we are creating ourselves. Remember, hip-hop is the art of self-creation. Hip-hop offers those of us who are hip hopers who can say, I am hip-hop. It offers us a way to recreate ourselves. And we're creating ourselves not just alone, but with God. God's actually creating through us. And when we can let go and let God, like uh, last week's message, when we learn and as we learn to let go and let God, we realize that encoded within us, just like the butter of the caterpillar, encoded within the caterpillar, encoded within the seed, encoded within our DNA, our very DNA and fabric. That's why I don't want no technology altering my DNA, and I will not allow that to happen. Can you feel me on that, my nobility? I know you can, and I know the future fills me because you're already starting to live it. You know what I'll say for this generation, for those who are alive and well right now in 2021, what I can say to the future about our generation, what makes us so great is we are making so many mistakes daily right now that you can look back at us and say, that's exactly what not to do. For real. I'm talking collectively, not individuals. You're going to look back and be inspired, inspired by because the future is going to see what the plan was all along. The future is going to see what the New World Order was going to trying to do. The future can already see how they were trying to oppress us all, every color, every race, every tribe, right here in 2021. The future can already see that. So the future can see those of us who actually had the courage to speak out, to speak God, to speak forth the word. The future is going to see us and say, yo, man. That's some, real, that's some real people right there. That's some real ancestors right there because they had the courage to speak out in those dark days. And they're going to see what a mess most of our population was in, what a mess most of our people were in. That's, that's what we're going to get into tonight. We're going to talk about in consciousness. And when we talk about in consciousness, we're going to move into the Bhagavad Gita reading and then come back around and, and, and close out with the gospel of hip hop. So I want to give a couple definitions first, because as we proceed with these readings, we want to talk about what is hip hop and how does hip hop lead to a whole new creation? Hip is awareness. It's a form of knowing. Hip means to know. It's a form of awareness. Hop is a form of movement. Hip is a form of intelligence. Hop is a form of movement. It's hip hop is intelligent movement. It's intelligent action. It's knowing why we do things. So to become a whole new creation, let's understand that the universe itself is hip hop. God is hip to God's hop. God is hip to God's hop. God knows why God moves and God knows why God moves us. So just like the seed, the seed has within its code the hip, the knowing. And then it hops forth through the earth. Now, there are things going on with that seed that it's not doing consciously. It's doing it all on its own because God is doing it through the seed, just like God is doing it through us. The same with the caterpillar. The caterpillar goes and it's following its nature. It's following its code. It's following the, the book of life that was written for it. And it goes into this cocoon state. And when it goes into this cocoon and it turns into that little glob of gel, it has no brain. It can't, it's not thinking itself at that moment into a caterpillar, I mean, into a butterfly. It's not thinking of itself as anything. In fact, it's just in a state of being still. But in its stillness, there's this action happening. And this action is happening through God. And it's growing this caterpillar into 
a butterfly. Same thing is happening with us, hip hop. The same thing is happening with us. Let's get to these definitions. So first, and the reason this applies is because when we get into the Bhagavad Gita, we're going to get into what's called the three gunas. The three gunas. G-U-N-A-S. The three gunas. And this is like, the gunas are like the fabric of life itself. And these three are ever present in life itself. And I want to have in consciousness part of this discussion. Because in consciousness holds us back. It's different than unconsciousness. It's something that kind of holds us back. It keeps us from moving forward. It keeps us from becoming a whole new creation. It keeps us back and, and it stagnates our lives. So if you got a copy of the Gospel of Hip Hop, go ahead and open up to page 243. Uh, and we're going to be reading paragraphs 43 through 46. Uh, page 243, paragraphs 43 through 46. And this is a much deeper discussion. This is in the fourth overstanding, the H law under H law is health, love, aware, health, love, awareness, and wealth. H law. Health, love, awareness, and wealth. H law. And this is in the awareness section of the H law. Page 243, paragraph 43 through 46. Paragraph 43. However, many people are stagnated in life, not by being ignorant, unaware, or unconscious, but by being unconscious, which is the inability to act upon one's own productive thoughts and plans. To be unconscious is to not be fully awake to the will of one's true self, different from unconsciousness, which is a mental slash physical condition more related to sleep or immobility, to be unconscious means to exist, yet be unaware of one's own existence and weak in the execution of one's own will. To be, yet not actually be. In consciousness can be said to be a state of self-awareness that is foreign to one's natural and true state of being. To be in conscious means that you are awake and alert, although an awareness that is artificial to you, to your real self. To be asleep to one's true self or to rest from one's true self can also be called in consciousness. In consciousness can be called the seat of unhappiness because it denies one the ability to actualize one's innate potentials. It, handicap, it handicaps the development of one's character and personality. An example of an unconscious human being is one who knows not his own purpose, who knows not his own purpose, yet is stimulated to the purposes of others. To surrender to this condition of mind can be called unconsciousness. Another example of unconsciousness is to feel your true purpose character, identity, and personality, yet fail to actualize them because of your own fears, insecurities, doubts, or other kinds of emotional and or mental inabilities. The emotional and or mental state of knowing yet not doing can be called unconscious. Drug addiction is another form of unconsciousness. It is that act of consciously doing things that you consciously don't really want to do. It is like observing yourself sleepwalking through life, bumping into things along the way. All right, word. There is so much to say about in consciousness that it could be a lesson in and of itself. But it's that state of being where we know we're supposed to be doing something, but we're not doing it. It's like a deer in the headlights. I say sometimes, it's like a deer in the headlights. When, when you're, if, you, if you've ever been in the mountains or you're ever driving down a country road at night and the deer are, are walking across the, the road and your headlights hit them, they look at you and they just freeze. And there's this car coming at the deer, but they don't know what to do. And so you got to stop or honk your horn and then they run away. But they'll just freeze and they don't know what to do. It's that frozen state, that inability to move forward, that unconsciousness that all of a sudden you don't know why you're doing what you're doing. You're not even hip to your hop. It's almost like you're not hip or you're not hop. You're not intelligently moving forward. And we're finding that a lot. You might even know what to do. 
In this definition, you even can know what to do. You're just not doing what you know to do. That's what I was talking about earlier, looking at our, you know, when the, the future looks upon this time that we're living in now, when those who come after us look upon this time that we're in now, what I hope they see is that we're just stuck, that the collectively, most people are just stuck in a state of unconsciousness, that they know what to do, they're just not doing it. And how many, how many of us have gone through that in life? Every single one of us has gone through that in life when we know what to do, but we're not doing it. That's in consciousness. It's like we're aware, but we're not fully aware. It's like we're, we're, we're kind of beating, but we're not fully beating. And that's a state that, that when you're hip to your hop, you're not in conscious. When your intelligence moving forward, there's no stagnation there. You're not holding anything back. You're not holding yourself back. So to be hip-hop, to be intelligently aware of why one does what one does, that's a state of high consciousness. That's a state of normal, everyday consciousness. That's a state of, I would even call, super consciousness. Um, that, that ability to be hip to one's hop, to be aware of your intelligent movement, that's, that's to be at one, to be at one mint, to be atoned, to be in the wholeness of all of creation itself. What a great place to be in because when we are, you know, when a whole, to become a whole new creation, we've got to be hip to our hop. And sometimes things are going to be happening through us that God's going to be moving us through that we're going to be even come more aware of after it's happening, but we're aware that it's God moving us. And so we surrender to God, which is the ultimate state of consciousness, to be surrendered to God. So like the caterpillar is surrendered to God at that moment, it begins doing, it begins making this cocoon. It doesn't really know. It may have even talked to other, you know, it may have gotten a word and, and another caterpillar said, hey, yo, in the future, we're going to go into this thing called a cocoon and we're going to come out and be one of those things flying around, a butterfly. And, and, and caterpillar be go like, I believe it, but I don't believe it. I don't know. This is kind of weird. I, something inside me tells me it's true, but I, I don't know how. I don't even have wings. Like, how am I going to become that? How do we become that? That doesn't even make sense. But the other caterpillar, the wiser caterpillar, really say, let's just trust in God. When we get to that moment, God's going to show us what to do. And the caterpillar's like, I don't really know how to transform into a butterfly. And the other caterpillar could be saying, yeah, but God knows how to transform us into a butterfly. And that younger, but, that younger caterpillar then grows up with that faith and then surrenders to God and allows God to work through the caterpillar to build the cocoon and then to come forward as a whole new creation, the butterfly. But I'll tell you, sometimes what happens in nature is a, a caterpillar becomes unconscious of itself and it dies a caterpillar. It never becomes a butterfly or it even dies, unfortunately, within the cocoon. And that happens to people, you know, we see them growing and we see them going on the path and then they just stop and they become stagnant in their movement. They say, I know my purpose, I'm an MC. And then they stop. And then 10 years go by, 15 years go by. I've seen it happen. I've seen and I know MCs and I feel for you if you're out there hearing me right now, my brothers and sisters. But you know what happens? I mean, I've seen MCs who for 15 years haven't grown in their craft. And there's a bitter sweetness when I pass them by and my skills got better than those who 15 years ago were, were, were freestyling and lighting up crowds, but they just, they, they said, I'm an MC. Now, maybe they, I hope they all found another purpose in life and that their MC and just led them to that purpose. But I think we all know those people in our lives who were, they were on a path and then for 15 years haven't, haven't changed that path. Now, maybe that 15 years has been a long cocoon, long gestation period. Maybe not. You know, but if, if you have been stagnant and unconscious, we, we're not butterflies, we're not seeds, we're actually human beings. So if you've been unconscious for 15 years and you just let a block of your life go by for 15 years, wake up, my nobility. Because, like I said, we are actually not butterflies. I mean, we're not caterpillars becoming butterflies. That's a metaphor. We're not even just seeds becoming trees. That's another metaphor. We're actually humans being. So that 15 years, use it to your advantage. If you was asleep for 15 years, use it to your advantage. Grab the mic, grab the pen, start rapping again. Give yourself three or four more years of hitting it hard and see where you emerge after that. 
There's no time to waste, for real. Our community needs our MCs to be speaking the truth to him. Not what people really, they, people think they want to hear, but what people actually need to hear, for real. That's what a real MC does. Real MCs give tough lessons to the community at times. It's just what, it's, just, it's the purpose of the MC. It's the purpose of any artist, really. Especially a minister or a teacher. That's, 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 the, that's the, the job <laughs> that you're signing up for. But if you do find yourself in an unconsciousness, I suggest you take, grab hold of your willpower, get that wherewithal going, grab that gumption, and get moving forward. Willpower. I found that out because I, I would get stuck periodically. We're all going to go through periods of unconsciousness in our growth. Because once we learn to push through that unconsciousness, then it never comes back. But we have to struggle with it, overcome it. Struggle with it, overcome it, struggle with it, overcome it. Victory. Victory is ours. You overcome the struggle enough times, you just you walk on water and victory is yours. So I, I know I found myself at periods of time in conscious. I knew what I needed to be doing, but I wasn't doing it. And sometimes, sometimes, don't get it twisted now. Overstand, because if you're working on what you need to be doing, if you're working towards your purpose and it feels like you're really not moving towards your purpose, you could be still in that state where you're becoming, you're getting ready to break through the ground. You're still growing, but you haven't grown into what you're going to become yet. That happens to us all the time. Know the difference between uh, being still and knowing God and being in conscious. Being in conscious, remember, is you know what you need to be doing, but you're not doing it. If you know what you need to be doing, get to doing it now. Get extreme with it. Take it to the extreme. Get obsessed with your right and get obsessed with your purpose. If you've got to check out of certain people around you in your life, that's okay. You don't always perform responsibility. If you're a, a father or a mother, you've got a child, you've got a responsibility to that child. But part of our responsibility to our children is us finding and living and developing our life purpose. Becoming a whole new creation, for real. And I'm telling you right now, this, this opportunity doesn't come along to every generation. It comes along to every individual who has these opportunities in life. But a collective generation like the hip-hop generation, a collective people that are worldwide, that we're all over the earth, we can't take this for granted. Hip-hoppers are everywhere facing the same challenges in every city on the earth. That's not by accident. That's not just because hip-hop's cool and people want to do it. That's by divine design. How else would it be that while the, the world is trying to implement the new world order, God is raising up the true world order? Because the world, represented by what we may even call the devil, is always trying to mimic God because it can't create for itself. The colonizer mimics who they're colonizing. All of them have done that throughout history. When Europe was being colonized by other so-called Europeans, Europeans is just another fallacy word. It doesn't even describe who my ancestors were. We didn't call ourselves Europeans. We didn't call ourselves any of those names. We had another, we didn't even speak English. We were at one with nature. Just like the Native Americans, just like Africans. That colonizer doesn't know what to do with itself. Whatever that disease is called the colonizer, whatever that parasite that calls itself the colonizer is, it can't create anything in and of itself. It has to mimic the children of God. It has to mimic God. And is that they're actually created by God as well. How about that? It's all the wholeness. It's all the oneness. But that parasite that's infested the colonizer that narcissistic parasite that's infected the colonizer, has guys thinking that they can turn us into robots and that we're going to reach our full human potential by merging ourselves with technology? How stupid can you be? 
How insane. You can't live through it forever through technology. You live through forever through God's technology, through the DNA, through spirit. I'm telling you right now, God has a plan for us. It's a whole new creation. And we're learning who not to be right now. We're learning what not to do right now. And the New World Order is offering a great example of who not to be and what not to become. It's like Darth Vader, you know, the emperor in the Star Wars. In the Star Wars series, the original Star Wars series, Darth Vader and the Emperor, they represent the ultimate colonizer, the ultimate new world. Darth Vader was humanity meshed with technology. But the rebel fighters, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Princess Leia, Chewbacca, they represent hip-hop, they represent human intelligence, intelligence springing forth, that, that spirit of God within us that will not be colonized by the empire. But wow, is Darth Vader not a great example of what not to do and who not to become? The emperor, a great example of what never to be and what never to come and what not to worship and what not to cultivate and what not to follow. Let's get a little deeper now. This is where we're going to get into the personal. This is where we get, get into what's going on because as individuals, once we as individuals learn to overcome our in consciousness, then we will gradually begin to overcome our collective in consciousness. We each have our part. We each have our part to play. And that's why each one of us is important in this. That's why you're important in this. And that's why you're hearing this word right now. All right, we're going to get into a reading from the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita. I, I personally, this is my favorite, a new translation by Stephen Mitchell. Um, the, there's other versions of the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of Life. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're, they're, they're all different, and they all have their different uniqueness about them. I just appreciate the way Stephen Mitchell returned to the poetry. Remember, the Bhagavad Gita is literally the Song of Life. This is a song. Like all great, all the great, you know, the Psalms of David, those are songs that are to be sung. The Holy Quran is to be sung. It's a song. It's somebody's lyric book. That's what this is. This is a lyric book. And wow, is this profound. But before we get to this, I'm going to read some definitions because I'm going to be talking about something in here. But I want to talk about these definitions because it's going to become really clear as we read Perform the Yoga of Action. Also got a definition from the uh, third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary for the word desire. Shout out to my sister, Queen Desire. I see you out there, my nobility. Um, I'm going to talk about the word desire because that's actually going to be in the Bhagavad Gita as well. But I took some notes. These are just my own personal notes on what the, these terms mean. So we're talking about the three gunas, G-U-N-A-S. And... and I, it can be interpreted to what's called the thread of life. It's always intersecting with itself. It's like this thread of life. The Hopi call it spider woman. It's this thread of life that connects all of us, this light energy that connects us all. Those of you who've ever tried magic mushrooms know what I'm talking about. You can see the thread of life in all creation. Certain natural hallucinogenics from the earth put you in a state of being where you can actually see how like all of this light is reflected, like there's no distance between myself and this crystal. Although my hands here, there is all these webs and weaving going in. This is how we're seeing this, that is reflected light. Even through that camera aperture, it's picking up this reflected light, this real beating, this web that is weaving us all together, even across time and space. That's why I can say something, and certain people in the future who aren't even in this room, may not even be born yet, can actually feel what I'm saying because it's, it's, it's hitting these, this web of life. It's like the web of a spider. You know, the web of a spider, it tings and it sets a vibration forward. There's a vibrational frequency coming out of all of creation, all of inanimate matter, all of animated matter. This moving us, that's interwoven with each other. It weaves together all of creation. I call it the crystallographic web. The crystallographic web, because it's like this web, these tiny webs. Like if you look at a spider web, it's got a rainbow in it, like a liquid, like a crystal light web. 
you look through it and it's like a crystal. Like if you hit it with certain light, you'll see a spider web almost rainbows out. And our ancestors knew this, especially the Hopi. They called, they called it spider woman. Spider woman wove together all of creation. The creator spoke forward the word and it vibrated into spider woman's web. And it vibrated light, sound, frequency. This vibrating all of us right here and right now. <laughs> word. So the three gunas, the thread of life, they're always present. The first one is sattva, S-A-T-V-A, sattva. And it's moving forward. It's what is real and true. Beauty, balance, inspiration, life, energy, health, vitality, joy, sattva. Sattva is awareness. Sattva could be called hip. For those of us hip hoppers who can see ourselves in other books, we can see ourselves. Sattva is a form of awareness. It is hip. It's moving forward. Now, that would also be hop, would be intelligent movement, but the hip is the mind moving forward. It's, it's what is real and true. It's beauty. It's balance to know what is beautiful, to know what is balanced. Inspiration, to know what is actual inspiration, to know life itself, to know the energy of life, to know health, to know vitality, to know joy. That's awareness. The second gunas is rahas. Being still, still in motion. The energy of change. It's passion. It's desire. It's effort and pain. That's the movement. That's hop. You mean hop as in hop as in movement can be painful? Did you ever learn to walk? Did you ever go through puberty? As we're growing, growth can be painful. Embrace that. Embrace that pain. Athletes do it all the time. They dig deep. They embrace that pain and they come out a whole new creation, a whole new level of who they were before, a better version, not just a better version of them old selves, but a whole new creation. Getting stronger. <laughs> Rahas, movement, hop. It's stillness in motion, the energy of change. Energy of change is that hop, it's that, in, it's that movement. The sattva is hip, the rahas is movement, it's hop. And then, there's, and then there's this other one, tamas. The third gunas is tamas, T-A-M-A-S. And it's losing our way, dullness, dense, lifeless, stale, lethargy, procrastination. That's in consciousness. Now, I'm not comparing what we're teaching in the gospel of hip-hop to what the Bhagavad Gita is teaching, but what I'm doing is I'm bringing an awareness that this is ancient wisdom we're talking about. And, of course, I'm a hip hopper, so I'm biased to hip-hop. I, I, live, I live a subjective reality. I'm not just objective to my reality. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at this Bhagavad Gita subjectively. How is this speaking to me? How is this speaking to my nobility? How is this ancient awareness speaking to us? Can we learn and glean some wisdom from this? Well, yeah, we can. The three gunas, it's the thread of life. It's weaving everything together. Are you hip to your hop? Or are you unconscious? Are you just being still? You know what to do, but you're not doing it. That's tamas, sattva, rahas, tamas, the three gunas. That's Hinduism. That's Bhagavad Gita, really. That's the teachings of Lord Krishna to Arjuna. Now, I want to also give up here just... I, I want to give those definitions so when I read from the Bhagavad Gita, we've got some, we've got some substance to work with there. So you have an understanding when it brings them up what we're actually talking about. Are you hip to your hop or are you unconscious? And I think you can be unconscious to your hip or hop. You could be hip and not know how to move or you could be moving and not even knowing why you're moved. 
But you could be moving and not knowing why you're moving because God's moving you. So keep that in mind. Surrender to God is the ultimate. And that's what we're going to talk about in um, the yoga of action. But before we get there, it's going to talk about the word desire. And I want to give uh, a de- the definition that we're going to be working from, from the Bhagavad Gita, about the word desire, because there's a lot of different definitions about what the word desire can actually mean. But as we see here in the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, desire, to wish or long for, to want, to, to express a wish for, request, a wish or longing, a request or petition, the object of longing. My greatest desire is to go back home. The definition four, sexual appetite, passion. So what we're going to be looking for in desire here is the object of longing. My greatest desire is to go back home, to wish for, or a wish or longing. It's like this wishful thinking, really. It's not the actual doing to become it. And I did want to say, too, um, another more modern way that we look at desire is passion. And that's, that's what my sister desire, nobility. That's the desire that she's talking about with her name, desire. It's passion. It's being, she's passionate about, uh, she calls herself the culture seed. She's passionate about the future of hip-hop. She's passionate about what it means to be hip-hop. She's passionate about hip-hop. That's her desire is to see hip-hop grow into what it's destined to be. But the desire that we're talking about here, the desire that we're going to be talking about in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the a longing for, uh, that, that longing, I, I just I long for this or I long for that. that. That's the kind of desire that when um, I, I first met the teacher and he asked me, he said, Zin, what element are you? What, you're, you're, what of, the, of, the, of the core four elements, breaking MC and graffiti art DJing, which one are you mastering? I said, yo, teacher, I'm an MC. And he told me, he told me this, he said, Zin, You'll know you're an MC when you give up your desire to be an MC. When you no longer desire to be an MC, then then you'll know you're an MC. And keep in mind, this was, I hadn't even written my first rhyme yet when I told the teacher that I was an MC. When I told teacher I'm an MC, I had not even written my first rhyme yet. I still desired to be the MC. But when we desire to be something, we aren't actually what we're desiring to be. I don't desire to be a man because I am a man. I don't desire to be fresh because I am fresh. You feel what I'm saying there? We don't desire what we already are. I don't desire an SN95 Mustang because I got a 2003 SN95 Mustang. I don't desire what I already have. You got a couch probably. You don't desire a couch. You might desire a new couch. So you might desire and long for a new life, but you're never going to get that new life until you actually go and become the new life. Then you'll no longer desire the new life. The Bhagavad Gita. Another quick, quick, quick lesson in this. And I just want to suggest to my nobility, you get this book and you read it. It's one of the greatest books ever written. It's 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 one of the the most classic pieces of literature of, of spirituality timeless knowledge, timeless wisdom in this book. And, and just a quick synopsis of what's happening in this book is there's a, there's a young prince by the name of Arjuna. And he's got a, he's, he's, he's got a, he's in a chariot surveying a battlefield. He's about to partake in this giant battle between f- opposing families. And it happens to be his family members are on the, some of his family members are on the opposing side. He's about to go to war with people he grew up loving and respecting. He's about to go to war with even members of, some of the members of his own family. And so while he's surveying this battle scene, this great battle that's about to happen, this young prince, this young warrior who's going to be leading an army into the charge, he's got this driver of his chariot, Krishna, a god. God is driving Arjuna's chariot. And Krishna, or Arjuna is lamenting to Krishna. He starts asking Krishna, Yo, Krishna, I don't want to go to battle. I don't want to fight these people I know, my uncles, my, my teachers, my, all these people that I used to know. I don't want to go to war against them, God. 
And remember, it's him and his family against him, other members of his family. He don't want that. It's a civil war that's about to break loose. And so as he's going into this war, this civil war that's about to break loose, he doesn't want to do it. His heart's heavy. His heart's burdened. And so who, what he thinks is just this chariot driver, who's just driving this chariot around for him, is actually God, the Lord Krishna, God and man, teaching Arjuna why he must go into battle, why he must go and fight and have the victory and fight for goodness, because if he doesn't fight, evil will prevail. Krishna must go and fight, I mean, Arjuna must go and fight the good fight, but he sees who his opposition is and his heart is burdened, and that's what this book is about. And we all go through it. It's the hero's quest. Arjuna is the hero's quest. The Bhagavad Gita is the song of life. But we're going to jump ahead, jump ahead to chapter 3 here. The yoga of action. This is really important because as Arjuna is preparing for this battle, he has to understand who he is and what he's about. And to understand himself, he has to understand his opposition as well. We are each other. We are all connected by the gunas, by this web, this web of life. We're all connected. So to understand ourselves, we have to understand others as well. And to understand others, we have to understand ourselves. Chapter 3 in the Bhagavad Gita, the yoga of action. Arjuna said, If you think that understanding is superior to action, Krishna, why do you keep on urging me to engage in this savage act? With words that seem inconsistent, your teaching has bewildered my mind. Tell me, what must I do to arrive at the highest good? The blessed Lord said, In this world, there are two main paths the yoga of understanding for contemplative men, and for men who are active, the yoga of action. Not by avoiding actions does a man gain freedom from action, and not by renunciation alone can he reach the goal. Remember, Arjuna doesn't want to go and fight. No one, not even for an instant, can exist exist without acting. And that means action. All beings are compelled, however unwilling, by the three strands of nature called gunas. We read about that earlier. He who controls his actions, but lets his mind dwell on sense objects, is deluding himself and spoiling the search for the deepest truth. Let's read that one again. He who controls his actions but lets his mind dwell on sense objects is deluding himself and spoiling his search for the deepest truth. And what that means is that those who know their actions but are still deluded by, you know, how many hip hop is, how many times have we seen this? And and it's okay to want something. You know, you want a fresh whip. You need to have a fresh whip. You You want a nice house. It's okay to want and have those things, but keep it in perspective. There's something greater going on. And there's so many people who perform the actions just to keep their world sustained by the worldly objects that they have. They want to keep their stuff. They want a newer, more expensive car. They want a nicer car. They want a nicer house, a more expensive house. And I'm not faulting that. It's just an immaturity. And, and as Krishna says here, you know, he who controls his actions, you know, they're controlling their actions, they're working towards these new things all the time, but lets his mind dwell on those same sense objects, is deluding himself and spoiling his search for the deepest truth. Krishna's telling us right there, he's telling Arjuna right there, the deepest truth of life is not any of this stuff that we're seeking, any of this material objects. And you're deluding, those who do that are deluding themselves. We see it in mainstream rap all the time. I can't believe that they're still driving the same boat that they drove 25 years ago. They're driving, bragging about the same money they made 25 years ago. Deluding themselves. Those rappers who somehow have stayed in the mainstream, 
You know who I'm talking about. And are still rapping about the same material objects that they, they, they had and the same material reality that they did 25 years ago are deluding themselves. They're missing the point of life. That's why, that's why it, to be jealous of them or to look up to them is a fallacy. I'm not dissing them. They're just immature spirits. They're just immature souls. I'm not judging them. Let them do what they're here to do. But those of us who know, that's, that they're deluding themselves with the nature of the world. Let's continue. The superior man is he whose mind can control his senses. With no attachment to results, he engages in the yoga of action. That's not an attachment the way that the Bhagavad Gita teaches it, which is a little different, and we'll get into that in a future message from the minister. I've actually talked about this on a video. Um, I'll, I'll put a link below in the past. In the past, I talked about this. The, 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 the form of detachment talked about in the Bhagavad Gita is different than the form of detachment taught by Buddhists. Um, not one's better, not one's worse. They're just, they're just different aspects of something that's going on. But this is very important. The superior man is he whose mind can control his senses with no attachment to results. He engages in the yoga of action. Do any actions you must do, since action is better than inaction. Even the existence of your body depends on necessary actions. The whole world becomes a slave to its own activity, Arjuna. If you want to be truly free, perform all actions as Worship. Wow, you talk about detachment. Perform every action of wor as worship. This action of speaking, this message from the minister, this is me worshiping God, the creator, thanking God, giving gratitude for God for this gift I've been given, this purpose that we've been given. When you have your purpose and you're living your life's purpose, that's a gift from God. Do it as an act of worship to God. And we also learn that worship is a form of cultivation. The whole world becomes a slave to its own activity, Arjuna. We see this all the time. I'm telling you, we see this all the time outside, in the outside world. The whole world is a slave to its activity, Arjuna. If you want to be truly free, perform all actions as worship. The Lord of creatures formed worship together with mankind and said, Be worship. By worship you will always be fruitful and your wishes will be fulfilled. By worship, you will nourish the gods, and the gods will nourish you in turn. By nourishment, by nourishing one another, you assure the well-being of all. By nourishing one another, we assure the well-being of all. That's community. With one another, and he's just not, and Krishna is deep here because Krishna is talking about all of creation. Krishna is talking about, you know, nurturing the animals, nurturing the garden, nurturing the earth, nurturing one another, cultivating our worship with God. Performing all actions as worship is the ultimate form of non attachment. That's how we escape. The whole world becomes a slave to its own activity, Arjuna. If you want to be truly free, perform all actions as worship. That's how the slave becomes free, by performing all actions as actions of worship. When, when we worship God, when we perform the action of worship, when we do things because we're worshiping God, we're high-minded at that moment. We do things that are in our character, the nature of God. All these, all these people in the media are not worshiping God publicly. They're not performing. I'm not speaking of them as individuals. I'm speaking collectively. These so-called politicians running around. They're slaves. The so-called master is, is the biggest slave of them all. Nourished by your worship, the gods will grant whatever you desire. But he who accepts their gifts and gives nothing back is a thief. Good men are released from their sins when they eat food offered in worship. But the wicked devour their own evil when they cook for themselves alone. 
Beings arise from food. Food arises from rain. Rain arises from worship. Worship from ritual action. Ritual action from God. God from the deathless self. Thus, the all-present God requires the worship of men. Krishna's talking about cultivation. The giving and receiving with God. God gives us these gifts so we can give them to others. We become the hands, the voice, the feet, the legs of God. God needs our help. What does that make us? Can we get out of our ego and start worshiping our creator, the one who created us all, the great event? He who fails to keep turning the wheels thus set in motion has damaged the workings of the world and has wasted his life, Arjuna. That's in consciousness right there. He who fails to keep turning the wheels thus set in motion has damaged the working of the world and has wasted his life, Arjuna. But the man who delights in the self, source energy life force, who feels pure contentment and finds perfect peace in the self for him, there is no need to act. He has nothing to achieve by action, nothing to gain by inaction, nor does he depend on any person outside of himself. Without concern for results, perform the necessary action, surrendering all attachment, accomplish life's highest good. Without concern for results, let go and let God. Don't be concerned with the results of our actions. Act. Act out of our highest good. Act out of worship for God. Don't be concerned with the results. Let God take care of the results. You water the seed. Don't be concerned if the seed's going to grow. The seed's going to grow. Water the seed. Plant the seed. Water the seed. Let God allow it to grow through the earth. That's the results. Only by selfless action did Janaka and the other wise kings govern and thus assure the well-being of the whole world? Whatever a great man does, ordinary people will do. Whatever standard he sets, everyone else will follow. In all three worlds, all the three worlds, Arjuna, there is nothing I need to do. This is Krishna talking, remember. Krishna has ascended. Krishna is God. Arjuna, there is nothing I need to do, nothing I must attain, and yet I engage in all action. I engage in action. For if I were to refrain from my tireless, continual action, mankind would follow my example. It would also not act, Arjuna. If I stopped acting, these worlds would plunge into ruin. Chaos would overpower all beings. Mankind would be destroyed. Same for all of us. Though the unwise cling to their actions, watching for results, the wise are free of attachments and act for the well-being of the whole world. The wise man does not unsettle the minds of the ignorant. Quietly acting in the spirit of yoga, he inspires them to do the same. Being hip to your hop means to know that God is the doer that there is an intelligence in the universe that is moving through us, that there is a hip-hop, an intelligent movement going through us. It's not even us doing it. It's, it's God doing it through us. The wise man knows that when objects act on the senses, it is merely the gunas acting upon the gunas, thus he is unattached. It's either the hip acting towards the hop, it's either the hop acting with the hip, or it's the unconsciousness. It's only one of those three. If things are happening, and, it, and it's intelligent movement moving forward, that hip hop is happening, that's that God force. And it's also the God force, the unconsciousness is also, God is all that there is, but the wise man can see that those who are stuck in unconsciousness are there, and that's just part of nature itself as well. So we want to act, we want to be hip to our hop to inspire those who are not hip to their hop to become hip to their hop. Wake up, my nobility, become hip to your hop so your children will be inspired to be hip to their hop. Deluded by the gunas, men grow attached to the gunas. Actions, the insightful, should not disturb the minds of these foolish men. Performing all actions for my sake 
desireless, absorbed in the self, indifferent to I and mine. Let go of your grief and fight. Let go of your grief and fight. Let go of your grief and fight. Men who constantly practice the teachings of mine, Arjuna, who trust it with all of their heart, are freed from the bondage of actions. But those who, mistrustful, half-hearted, fail to practice my teachings, wander in the darkness, lost, stupefied by delusions in consciousness, Even the wise man acts in accordance with his inner nature. All beings follow their nature. What good can repression do? A whole new creation. You can't oppress it. What good can it do? Let it flow through you. Craving and aversions arise when the sense encounters sense objects. Do not fall prey to these two brigands blocking your path. It is better to do your own duty badly than to perfectly do another's. You are safe from harm when you do what you should be doing. Check this out. It is better to do your own duty badly than to perfectly do another's. You are safe from harm when you do what you should be doing. Arjuna said, What is it that drives a man to, evil, to an evil action, Krishna, even against his will, as if some force made him do it? Man, that's a deep question. The blessed Lord said, The force is desire. It is anger arising from the guna called rahas, deadly and all devouring. That is the enemy here. As a fire is obscured by smoke, as a mirror is covered by dust, as a fetus is wrapped in his membrane, so wisdom is obscured by desire. Wisdom is destroyed, Arjuna, by the constant enemy of the wise, which flaring up as desire blazes the insatiable flames. Desire dwells in the senses, the mind, and the understanding of all of these. It obscures wisdom and perplexes the embodied self. Therefore, you must first control your senses, Arjuna, then destroy this evil that prevents you from ever knowing the truth. Men say that the senses are strong, but the mind is stronger than the senses. The understanding is stronger than the mind, And the strongest is self, knowing the self, sustaining the self, by the self, Arjuna, killed a difficult-to-conquer enemy called desire. Woo! Wow! Remember we talked about the, 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 the earlier definitions of desire. Not that, not that passion that we have for things. That's kind of a more of a modern word for desires. It's like passion people feel inside themselves that, that push and drive them forward. Not that. We're talking about the constant desire for sense objects, which are, you know, the cars, the, the, the houses, the money, the, the, the so-called, you know, ideals, the, 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 you know, just chasing these sense objects of the world and not putting God first. Not performing action out of God so we can learn the deeper lessons that God has for us. He's letting Arjuna know, like, Arjuna, you need to go to war right now. Like, the earth will fall if you don't go to a war. He tells Arjuna that later, like, the earth is depending on you right now, Arjuna. And that's Arjuna's purpose in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is learning about what his purpose is. What is your purpose? What are you holding yourself back from? Are you hip but don't know how to hop? Are you hopping around with no knowledge of why you're hopping? You got no hip. You're just hopping around, going from place to place, thing to thing, being blown by the breeze and not really knowing why and not really putting any intelligence to your movement. That's dangerous. That's the gunas called rahas that Krishna was talking about. It's like people moving around, they're hopping around, but they're not hip to their hop. Are you hip to your hop? Do you know why you move? Are you aware of why you were born? These are the questions of a whole new creation. 
Because when Arjuna eventually goes to war and is victorious, victorious, a whole new creation happens. When you live out your purpose, that's victory over the streets. When you live out your purpose, you discover your purpose and begin living it out as a worship, as a form of giving back to others what God has given to us, giving back to God what God has given to us. Feel that hip-hop. God gave us hip-hop. We should all be giving back to hip-hop nonstop because hip-hop gives to us. How many times have we seen people just take and take and take from hip-hop? Hip-hop gave them everything. Hip-hop gave them the, white, the cars, the mansions, the career, the fame. Hip-hop gave these rappers the world, and they ain't giving nothing back to hip-hop. They don't even acknowledge that hip-hop exists. Let it be. Because those of us who feel it, those of us who know it, those of us who live it, those of us who feel that passion within ourselves, those of us who wake up and we live this thing called hip-hop that we call hip-hop, this intelligent movement, we're giving back to God, we're giving back to our community. You see it all the time, those who actually give back to their community, the community uplifts them. You don't got to see them on the news or television, who cares? That's an illusion. Those rappers live an illusionary life. I know I've met them. It's an illusionary life, not the MCs. Now, sometimes an MC can be famous. There are famous MCs who people are known well all over the world. The teacher is one of them. But we can see by his example that he knows what God gave him as hip hop through hip hop. That's why he's giving it back. That's why he's giving back the gift and setting the example, like Krishna talked about. And interesting enough, KRS, will you say tag his name Krishna one, because he was given a copy of the Bhagavad Gita when he was at the young men's homeless shelter, and they started calling him Krishna. Those who saw him reading the book, the Bhagavad Gita, and KRS is short for it's a shortened form of Krishna. How dope is that? He's living that example that Krishna set forth for real. Looks like Krishna, too. <laughs> but he's, he's set forth that example that Krishna's talking about in the Bhagavad Gita. He's giving back. He's a wise man giving back. Let's be wise men and women and give back to our community. Give back to God what God has given us first. God gave us life, so we should give back to life. God gave us the breath of life. We should give the breath of life, give back to God. Doing everything is an act of worship. That is a whole new creation. This mind state, this mindset, the more of us that start doing this, that leads to a whole new creation. Perform the yoga of action. Perform action. Which reminds me, while I'm holding the book, let's just read this. It's only, what, one, two, it's only three pages here. Two and a half pages, really. Um, the third overstanding, the divine performance, divine performance number 16, perform action on page 184. For those of you reading along, perform action. The most important thing to know of oneself is one's purpose. The fulfillment of one's life purpose is the cause of true joy and happiness. Do not become idle or live without purpose. Although you may be still seeking your purpose, perform action. Never just sit around being unaware of the effects of your actions on your non-action or your non-action. The attuned hip hop shows others through example what righteousness, love, justice, charity, and overstanding looks like. The attuned hip hop is aware of how her actions teach society. Such a hip hop knows that every social act is a lesson performed in and for one's family, friends, and a larger society. Inspire your friends and family, my nobility. Inspire them. Paragraph 2. For every cause or act, there is an effect or response. Be aware of what you cause to exist through your thinking and your actions. 
We are the offspring of our own actions. We actually create ourselves through action, which is motivated by purpose. So what's your purpose? If you lack direction or purpose in life, focus your mind upon the actions of your teacher. Pay attention to the way that your teacher performs in action and imitate those performances. Know that your teacher is impartial to success or failure. That's detachment. Let go and let God. See how your teacher is not attached to the effects of the act, not, a, not attached to the results. Feel how your teacher not only gives, but sacrifices. The attuned hip-hop overstands that even while acting, we do nothing at all. The attuned hip-hop knows that all is the great oneness deity, and, is, oh, and it is only God that actually acts. When we are eating, breathing, talking, walking, working, driving, etc., we really do nothing at all. Only God, through nature, is moving, which gives us the temporary appearance of movement. The attuned hippapa does not act nor cause action when it is understood that all action is the divine performance of God. We are actually the effects of God in action. Like when the wind blows dried leaves across the road, the leaf has no sense of the wind blowing them along, yet the leaf moves. Physical bodies have movement in a similar way. Forces, winds, blow upon us, against us, and push us towards the circumstances or that circumstance. We must learn to navigate the forces, the winds of life, towards the fulfillment of our life's purpose. However, such navigation has more to do with allowing the force being surrendered here. However, such navigation has more to do with allowing the force to carry you without you getting in your own way. Spiritual navigation has to do with allowing God to guide your life. It's about God's leadership in your life. Some people regard God's leadership in their lives as a choice. They say, I now give my life to God, as if they had the authority to do such a thing. The leadership of God in your life is not a choice. It is the truth. It's a realization, an awakening, a new awareness, a sense of giving up and letting go on your part. The leadership of God is happening now. It is you who must realize this by realizing your fears. Um, excuse me. It is you who must realize this by releasing your fears, doubts, and disbeliefs about your own God force. We must get in harmony with what God is already doing in our lives. Know this. When our will is not the will of our God, we naturally begin to experience pain and suffering. The will of God is for the hip hoppa to be joyous, at peace, and prosperous. Our God's will is occurring long before we come to realize it. And those things which happen against our will are usually for our own good. For God sustains life itself. You do not choose God. God chooses you. Because life is sustained by God, every act of the hip hop should be performed as a tribute and sacrifice to God. Are you guys seeing this? Are you seeing how the yoga of action and perform action are, 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 are it's identical wisdom and knowledge right here? Because life is sustained by God, Every act of the hip hop should be performed as a tribute and sacrifice to God. That's worship. No work or person is too difficult to deal with when all is done as a tribute and service to your God. With this, the attuned hip hop escapes the cycles of cause and effect because the attuned hip hop causes nothing and is detached from everything. Only God is moving, acting, and speaking. Perform difficult activities knowing this. E. L. Magoon once said, Existence was given for us for action. Wait, 
Existence was given to us for action rather than indolent and aimless contemplation. Our worth is determined by the good deeds we do rather than by the fine emotions we feel. They greatly mistake who suppose that God cares for no other pursuit than devotion. Perform action. I want to go back here too, and just for a minute, you know, every act of the hip should be performed as a tribute and sacrifice to God. A tribute and service to your God. Tribute, sacrifice, service, those are better words for our modern understanding of what worship is, because a lot of us grew up and we think worship is like, Praise ye God, we praise ye and worship ye God. And there's a part of our heart that is a song of life. Praise ye God, our hearts we praise you God. That's worship. We really do sing that out. But it's performance of our actions. It's not just we feel good feelings and that's all that God wants from us. Didn't Jesus teach to feed the homeless, to take care of the widows, to be in service to one another? Didn't Krishna just give that lesson to Arjuna as well? Didn't the teacher just give that lesson and perform action as well? What is your purpose? God gave you a purpose. It's time to wake up to that purpose and start giving it back to God. A whole new creation. A whole new creation is being born right now. Become a whole new creation. Not just a better version of your old self. What kind of caterpillar wants to just become a better caterpillar? No, the caterpillar wants to become a whole new creation. The caterpillar wants to become the butterfly. The caterpillar's purpose is to become a butterfly, not to become a better version of a caterpillar. Not to just keep becoming a better version of a caterpillar. A seed's purpose is not to become a better version of the seed. A seed's purpose is to become a tree. Your purpose is not to become a better version of your old self. Your purpose is to become a whole new creation. Our purpose collectively as hip-hop is not to become better versions of our old selves, but to become a whole new creation. That's the promised land. It's not to become better versions of Americans or whatever country we live ourselves in. Not to become better Canadians, better, you know, whatever. Better Africans, better Nigerians, better Colombians. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to become a whole new creation, to become hip-hop. Not to become better versions of our old selves, but to become a whole new creation. This is a high call in my nobility. That's why I think about this 24 hours a day. That's why I'm preaching about this every week. That's why I've been living this for 15 years nonstop. Yeah, I had to grow. Yeah, I had to break through the ground. Yeah, I had to go through my moments and my times of unconsciousness. I had to break through that unconsciousness with willpower so I knew how to live my purpose day to day in my living. You need to take rest. You know, don't burn yourself out and not get proper sleep and get proper rest. That's part of performing action to know when to be still and rest and meditate and get clear. Stillness and action, that's Zen. Action and stillness, being still while we're in action, while we're performing actions, that's, that's the art of Zen, Z-E-N. Let's rise up to the vision that God has for us as individuals and as a collective. We've got no time to waste. I say it every week. We've got no time to waste. This world is not slowing down for nobody. This world is on a crash course towards its own destruction. The world is heading towards self-destruction. Hip-hop, do not follow the ways of the world or you will be destroyed with the world. Follow the ways of God and you will be made a whole new creation with God, through God. God will not be mocked. The world is mocking God right now at this very moment. God will not be mocked. But God is patient. God is kind. God is full of grace. But that grace, it has a time frame. And when God's grace runs out, the grace that God's given to the world, 
We hip hoppers, we need to be ready for that. We have to prepare ourselves collectively for that. As I was saying earlier, man, I struggled this week. I was feeling that at the time. I sat with God. I was like, yo, God, why ain't nobody hearing me? Why are those closest to me even not hearing what I'm saying most of the time? Why are those, those people that I've known and interacted with it's hip-hop for years and years not really hearing me, not asking any questions, not really changing their lives, God? Because it, it bothers me to see young men and women Pursuing the ways of the world and not their purpose. Especially when they got the knowledge. Now, I know God told me, God said, perform patience. So I want to pass that on. God's telling us to perform patience with this. God's telling us that to be joyful, to have a warm heart about this, to see the hope, to have the faith. Because the future fills our frequency right now. Those of us who are creating this, those of us who are becoming a whole new creation. That new creation fills us the same way the tree always remembers its seed. The same way the the butterfly remembers the caterpillar. The butterfly knows what it's like to be a caterpillar too. The caterpillar doesn't know what it's like to be a butterfly yet. And as I was saying earlier too, we're we're not caterpillars becoming butterflies. That's a metaphor. We're humans being. We're becoming a whole new creation. What God has destined for us. And there's a lot of unknown things happening. That's where we put our faith in God. There's going to be times as you're walking the path that you don't know what's going on. But keep performing action. If you're an MC, keep writing your rhymes. Keep rapping. Keep doing that. Because your emceeing is going to lead you to your purpose. Your emceeing will just become a part of your purpose if you're a spokesperson for your community. If you're a DJ and you're making that music, that musical frequency, the vibration of music. We all know that music can change our day, can change our mood, can change our attitude, can change our life. That's how important the DJ is. What about the dancers who are moving around and actually moving the energetic life force of the earth itself, moving their energies around? Moving that energy around, man, that actually causes an effect. It's moving energy. It's, it's moving that spider web that we spoke of earlier. It's throwing energy through that. It's, it's actually changing the environment. It's adding energy to the environment. And the artist who's painting the the, the murals and the colors in the city and and colors that people put in their home, that's sound, that's light frequency. It changes the vibrational frequency of our body when we see beautiful colors. That's why the art is so important. And all of its forms, jewelry, clothing, fashion, landscaping, house design. That's the new earth. Can you see hip-hopia in your lifetime? Can you see the whole new creation that's happening right before your very eyes? Jump in. Participate in it. Become one with it. Become one with yourself. Become one with God again. That's all this is about. Did you ever wonder why you came to earth? It's not to work a nine to five for somebody else slaving away at a job that you hate. I know we got to provide for our kids. I've been there. I know what it's like. But is your faith in the world or is your faith in God? Which one? Perform responsibility, but be responsible to your purpose and to your God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why worry what the birds, the the, the birds don't worry about what they're going to eat the next day. God feeds the birds. God feeds the fields and the trees. God will feed you. Walk your purpose, and if you're young and your only responsibility is yourself, 
wow, what a golden opportunity for young people to ask, what is my purpose? I'm 18 years old, God, what's my purpose? And then go for it. It gets harder as you get older. It's just the way it is. But if you're older, ask God, what's my purpose? God, God will show you what your purpose is. Become a whole new creation. There's a new earth being born. And those who cling to the old earth, those who, well, those who cling to the old world, those who cling to the ways of the world, those who cling to the new world order, those who cling to the media, those who cling to, to, to the, the mainstream establishments, the, the, all these mainstream doctors and all this mainstream medicine and, and just cling to all this mainstream media and cling to that and these mainstream politics and these mainstream religions those who cling to that are going to fall because those things are not here they're not sustainable they're falling right now they've already fallen you'll fall with them if you cling with them but if you cling to god if you cling to spirituality if you cling to your christ within if you cling to nature if you cling to the earth the real earth the one that brings forth food and fruit and an abundance of everything for us, for each other, to give back, to give and receive. You'll rise with that. The one who clings to that will rise with that. The one who cultivates that, who worships that, will rise with that. Rise with God. Don't fall with the world. Rise with God, my nobility. Now is the time, and we are the people. Rise up, and there it is a whole new creation. Peace and so much love to my nobility. Hip, hip.